Hi folks, Josh Wolf with Wolf Vintage Watches here. Welcome to my shop. In this video, I'll be servicing a Hamilton Caliber 747 manual wind movement from a 1949 Hamilton Raymond. Let's get into it. Okay, the first step in any service is to remove the case back and to get at the movement. I'm lucky that this case back isn't scratched to high heaven with apprentice marks. Using the small tab and levering against the back of the lugs, the case back comes right off. I'm setting the time to 12 o'clock so I can remove the handset later. The movement is essentially pressure fit into the case back. Using a case knife, I can gently pry the dial and movement loose from the case back. I don't want to pry on just one side since this could bend the dial or snap a dial foot off. I rotate the watch around, prying a little in each corner until the movement is clear of the case back. And there it is, the American-made Hamilton 747. This really is a workhorse movement. I'll go into a little more detail of the history of it a little later. Taking a look inside the case back, it doesn't get much easier to identify this as a Raymond. There are at least two watchmaker's marks on there, so I'm certainly not the first person to have this watch in parts. With the bezel removed, I can pop the mineral glass crystal loose. Glass crystals use a little tougher adhesive and can be difficult to remove. Pressing around the edges of the crystal to try not to shatter it, I eventually spring it free. Alright, now I can get back to the dial and the movement. I use a piece of plastic to protect the dial and hands and I remove the hour and minute hands. To remove the sub-seconds hand, I sometimes like to pull it off with the dial. Here I'm loosening the dial feet screws so I can take the dial off. As I lift the dial straight out of the movement, the sub-seconds hand comes with it. I use this method when the seconds hand is too close to the dial to get hand levers under it safely. Disassembly of the dial side begins with the dial washer and the hour wheel. The two screws securing the setting lever spring are removed. The minute wheel is taken out, followed by the setting wheel. Using angled tweezers as a lever, I can pull the canyon pin in from its pivot. The yoke spring is next to come out, and then I can grab the yoke itself. With the movement flipped over to the watchmaker side, I can unscrew the setting lever completely. The crown and stem are now removed. The winding pinion and clutch wheel are removed. Much easier when there isn't a ton of grease like in the Caliber 688 video. I tighten up the dial feet screws again before I forget. With the mainspring completely let down, I remove the ratchet wheel screw and the ratchet wheel. I call this technique the Wolf Reverse Tweeze. Now I can remove the crown wheel hub, also called the winding wheel hub, in the Hamilton Parts Catalog from 1949, again using the world famous Wolf Reverse Tweeze. The crown wheel comes out using the regular old tweezing technique. The click screw, click, and click spring are straightforward to remove. With all of those components stripped from the movement, I can now start taking the bridges off. As with most movements, all five bridge screws are the same, so I won't need to worry about that when it comes to reassembly. The barrel bridge is first to come off. There are specific points on the bridge where a screw can be inserted to pry it up. The same is true for the train bridge. You'll notice that the train bridge only has pivot holes for the escape and fourth wheel. The train of wheels is removed, starting with the center wheel followed by the third wheel, and the fourth wheel, and finally the escape wheel. The barrel is lifted away. Oh, and I'll nab the setting lever screw right now too. Okay, all the screws have been relatively big so far, but now I need to loosen the hairspring stud screw to remove the balance complete. With the stud screw loosened, I nudge the hairspring stud out of its hole. Then I can remove the balance cock by prying it up with a screwdriver. I take a lot of care here as it's easy to break the balance staff pivot. I'll be disassembling the various components of the balance cock to ensure that they're all perfectly clean. And I'll also be cleaning the balance separately from the rest of the components. With all that out of the way, I can take out the pallet bridge, which is held in place with two screws. Here I'm grabbing the pallet fork and giving it the old stink eye before placing it in my parts tray. Two more very tiny screws hold in the lower balance end stone cap. I lucked out that this little guy got hung up on the movement and didn't bounce around on my bench. As with the dial feet screws, I tightened the hairspring stud screw back down prior to cleaning. I failed to do this once, and after fishing the screw out of the cleaning fluid, it took me what felt like forever to get it back into the hole. To remove the mainspring from the barrel, I pushed the arbor against the steel block. This will pop the cap loose, which I can grab with tweezers. When the cap sticks a bit like it is here, I slow down and am very careful to work it free from the arbor. I don't want the mainspring exploding in my face. Not even a little bit. The cap successfully removed, I can now work the arbor out of the end of the mainspring. 
Using my thumbs to keep the coiled portion of the mainspring safely in the barrel, I can uncoil the mainspring in a controlled manner. Once there is enough exposed, I walk the mainspring free from the barrel. Now that we've reached a riveting, high-paced, action-packed portion of the video, go ahead and hit the like button if you're enjoying the video so far. This particular section notwithstanding. This mainspring has a T-brace end. The two barbs that form the T fit into holes in the barrel and cap to hold the mainspring in place. Now I can work on disassembling the balance cock. I start by loosening the upper end stone cap retaining cam. Say that five times fast. This cam has three ramp type structures that pull the three arms of the upper end stone cap, securing both to the balance cock. To remove the cam, I just need to turn it a few degrees. And there it is, stuck to the end of my screwdriver. This is what I call a boing. With the cam removed, I separate the end stone cap from the regulator arm. All right, now the parts have been cleaned and dried, and it's time to get this little gem put back together again, starting with rewinding the mainspring. I use vintage mainspring winders for this job. I picked them up on eBay a few years ago, and they've served me faithfully ever since. I've been on the lookout for another set recently, though. I'm paranoid that I'll break or at least wear down the barb that hooks into the end of the mainspring, and I won't be able to use it anymore. I've seen some watchmakers hand wind mainsprings back into the barrel, but I've never been able to do so successfully myself. In all honesty, I run out of patience when I try and give up. I think I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. I lose patience and give up. When I get to the end of the mainspring, I need to work the last little bit into the handle around the T-brace. Then I can carefully take the winding arbor out. Here you can see the danger of pulling the winder out too quickly. This mainspring is grabbing onto the arbor, and there is a risk that the whole thing flies out if I don't take my time. With that successfully managed, the mainspring is wound up into the handle and ready to go back into the barrel. Once I have it fully seated, I press down on the plunger and it pushes the mainspring into the barrel. Every once in a while, I'll hit the jackpot and the T-brace will find the hole in the bottom of the barrel and I can move on. This is not one of those times. If I miss by too much, I'll have to take the mainspring out and start all over again. But in this case, since I'm pretty close, I can use a screwdriver to push the mainspring around until the T-brace seats into the hole. Now I can lubricate the barrel arbor on the face that rides against the hole in the barrel. Lining the arbor up with the barrel hole and the hole in the end of the mainspring, I work it into place. A spot of oil on the top of the arbor and the barrel cap is refitted. You can see here the smaller the two holes where the T-brace end needs to go. I line that small hole up and press the cap down into place. Eventually. The cap is secured into the barrel using tweezers. I'll now work on a little more subassembly by reinstalling the lower end stone cap. Using a piece of Rodico to hold the cap steady, I position the main plate over it. I make sure that the screw holes of the cap and the main plate line up as I bring the two components together. Once all is aligned, I press the main plate into the Rodico to keep everything still. I also have a word with my new cameraman about catching my flowing locks in this shot. The cap is secured to the main plate again with two screws. I didn't oil the end stone while it was off the main plate since I can use my auto oilers to do the lubrication once it's reassembled. The train of wheels is now refitted, starting with the escape wheel. The fourth wheel goes in next with its extended pivot for the sub-seconds hand. The third wheel is placed back into its pivot hole. And then the center wheel goes back in. The setting lever screw is refitted now, so I don't space it out and have to take off a bridge when I think I'm all done with the watchmaker side. I'll put the train bridge on first. I like this design since I only need to line up two pivots rather than the typical four. Even though it's easier, it still does take patience and a steady, non-caffeinated set of hands to get the escape wheel to line up. Here I'm just manipulating the escape wheel while applying very light downward pressure on the train bridge. It can be a bit of a balancing act. If I press too hard, I run the risk of breaking a pivot. If I don't press hard enough, the bridge won't fall into place once it's lined up with the pivot. Once I have it, still holding the bridge securely in place with a plastic pick, I get the two screws back in. I can lubricate the hole for the barrel arbor, and then slide the barrel back into place. The barrel bridge is now refit. 
Despite having two pivots from the center and third wheels, this bridge generally falls into place very easily. The two pivots are relatively large, especially on the center wheel, so the wheels don't need a lot of manipulation to get them to line up. All the work can be done with the bridge itself. I'll lightly screw in one of the bridge screws and then test again for free movement of the entire train of wheels. Looks good. Now I'll get the remaining two screws in and tighten all three of them down. The click spring is now installed, being careful not to launch it into my neighbor's backyard. This design of the click spring is super easy to reinstall since it's never really ever under any load before the ratchet wheel is installed. The click has a little arm on the underside that interacts with the click spring. I just need to make sure I have it on the correct side of the spring before securing the click screw. Quick little test to make sure all is well. Here I'm oiling the top barrel hole. Okay, now I'm reinstalling the crown wheel or the winding wheel per Hamilton's spec sheet. I'm adding a touch of oil where the wheel contacts the hub, which I will get situated next. To refit the crown wheel or winding wheel hub, I need to line up the screw holes. On some movements, I've noticed the holes are not perfectly symmetrical, so I make sure the two holes in the hub line up with the two holes in the barrel bridge before screwing everything down. Some more testing for free movement here. Now for the ratchet wheel. This wheel needs to line up with the square sides of the barrel arbor and the teeth need to mesh with the click and the crown wheel. Every watch has its own personality. This watch seems to have a bit of an ornery personality and straightforward component installs aren't as straightforward as they should be. The ratchet wheel screw is tightened down with the help from a pick to hold the wheel steady. To install the pallet fork, I'll line up the lower pivot with its hole and make sure that the pallet arm is between the two banking pins. I also need to be mindful that the pallet stones are on the same plane as the teeth of the escape wheel. It's pretty easy to have one of the pallet stones on top or below the teeth which will prevent the pivot from seating into its hole. Now I can work on getting the pallet bridge installed. There are two screw holes as well as two alignment pins. Of course the pivot hole needs to line up with the pallet pivot as well. With all these points of contact the pallet bridge can sometimes rock around a bit and not seat itself correctly. Again just taking my time and making minor adjustments here and there. I get the pellet bridge fitted where it belongs. I put a little wind in the mainspring so I can test if power is making its way through the entire train properly. The pellet is indexing correctly so I'm confident that I can move on with lubricating the exit pellet stone. Since I'm in lubrication mode at this point I'll go ahead and oil the wheel train pivots with an auto oiler. Okay now I can reassemble the balance cock components. I place the upper end stone cap on the case cushion. Then I lay the regulator arm on top of it. Making sure the regulator arm will be positioned properly relative to the balance cock, I line up the holes for the end stone cap arm and drop the balance cock into place. To pull everything tightly together, I fit the upper end stone cap retaining cam and rotate it so the ramp shape tightens. I can now loosen the hairspring stud screw to make room for the hairspring stud. I have to use my smallest screwdriver for this and it has to be sharp so I don't mangle the screw. Here I'm lubricating the end stone with an auto oiler again since I didn't oil it when it was out of the balance cock. This is a look at the balance complete. You can see the hairspring and the hairspring stud. I need to fit that stud into its hole and then tighten the screw down to secure it. I line up the balance staff with the pivot hole and the stud with its hole. I'm not too concerned with the hairspring lining up between the regulator pins at this point. Wedging my tweezers between the alignment pins of the balance cock, I can lift it away from the case cushion to have room to turn my screwdriver. Holding the balance cock this way with tweezers allows me to put enough pressure on the stud screw so the blade of the screwdriver won't slip. Alright, that all squared away, I can now get the whole assembly back into the watch. Making sure the impulse jewel is on the correct side of the pallet fork, I twist the balance cock into place. I line the top balance pivot hole up with the balance staff, and boom, we have a runner. The balance cock gets secured with a single screw to seat it flat against the main plate. Now onto the dial side. I'll lubricate the pivots on this side first before they're inaccessible. A little grease for the center wheel pivot and then I could push the canyon pin in on. Here I'm installing the setting lever. It's secured by the setting lever screw which, as you've seen, is accessed from the watchmaker side. I hold the setting lever in place with the tip of my finger, flip the movement over, and just get the screw started. I need to leave it loose so I can install the crown and stem later. 
I'll throw a little grease on the winding pinion and clutch wheel here. A little dab will do ya. Over lubrication, if you've seen any of my previous videos, can cause a lot of problems with the watch movement. In goes the clutch. And in goes the winding pinion. Before I insert the crown and stem, I'll add grease to the faces of the stem that slide through the winding pinion and clutch, as well as the groove that the setting lever locks into. With the crown and stem fitted, I can fully secure the setting lever screw now. A spot of grease on the clutch where the yoke will ride to prevent wear and tear. Speaking of the yoke, there it is. I'll manually move it back and forth a little to work some of the grease in and to make sure it's moving freely. I'll add grease to the points where the keyless works components interact with each other. Here I'm lubricating between the setting lever and the yoke where a majority of the friction occurs. Now I can install the yoke spring which provides the energy to push the yoke back to the winding position. Not being too stout of a spring, this yoke spring is moved into position easily. The contact point between the yoke and the yoke spring also gets a little grease. And I'll clean up any excess grease. The post for the setting wheel gets oil, as does the post for the minute wheel. Speaking of the minute wheel, here it is being installed. And there is the setting wheel going back home. The final component of the keyless works is the setting lever spring. This part secures all the other keyless works parts in place as well as creates two positions for the crown with the two grooves that are being lubricated here. A little test slash demonstration of the keyless works. Everything looks in order. Time setting function also looks excellent. Here I'm loosening the dial feet screws in preparation for installing the dial. I'll do a light cleaning of any dirt or debris with some Radico before I put it on the watch so I don't need to worry about any of the pivots. These numerals are solid 18 karat gold and are rhodium plated so they match the stainless steel case. The hour wheel goes into place, as does the dial washer. This little washer keeps the hour wheel seated and the teeth meshed when the dial is facing down. Lining up the 3 o'clock marker with the stem, the dial feet find their respective holes. I can then turn everything over so the weight of the movement holds it down onto the dial. Then I can secure the dial feet screws. I was able to dig a new old stock mineral glass crystal out of my stash to install into this watch. Since it is glass and not acrylic, I need to use a UV curing adhesive. I really like this glue, but my goodness does it smell bad before it's cured. Using a fine point precision tip, I apply a thin bead of adhesive along the inside of the bezel. I want decent coverage, but I want to also try to limit the amount of squeeze out. I set the crystal into place, being careful not to get any adhesive anywhere other than the edges. The adhesive can be cleaned up before it's cured, but if I can avoid doing extra work, I will. That's going on another t-shirt. If I can avoid doing extra work, I will. I make sure the bottom edges of the crystal are fully seated against the bottom edge of the bezel. Turns out there was a little squeeze out that I quickly clean up with some peg wood. The best source of UV light is free. My big issue is it only comes out during the day. So I picked up this nail drying UV lamp to cure UV crystal adhesive when it's convenient for me. While the crystal is cooking, I can get this 70 plus year old movement regulated. Very minor adjustments to get the timing dialed in. Let's see how we did on the time grapher. Seems pretty good to me. With the regulation out of the way, I can get the handset reinstalled now. I put the movement and dial into the case back and set the hour hand in place. Being time only, I can get the hour hand pressed on and then adjust it to 12 o'clock. With the hour hand aligned to midnight, I align the minute hand to the hour hand. Using a hand pressing tool, I press the minute hand onto the kidney pinion. I'm checking for clearance between both hands and between the hour hand and applied numerals here. And now the sub-seconds hand is pressed onto its pivot. More checking for clearance between the hour hand and the sub-seconds hand. The crystal adhesive is fully cured and I can now finish casing this beauty up. 
The caliber 747 was first introduced in 1947. Hamilton added shock protection to the movement in 1955 and changed the caliber number to 730. When an improved balance was added sometime in the mid-60s, the caliber number was again updated, this time to 731. All told, the 747 family of movements was in production for some 20-odd years. To see other service and restoration videos, click the playlist on the left. To help out the YouTube algorithm, check out the video on the right. Please remember to subscribe, like, and share, and leave your comments and questions below. As always, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye.